All right, let's start up here. Okay. So, last time, remember, we got into substitution reactions. Okay. And let's get into them more today. Some of you uh, got into the computer thing there. Uh, I'm going to hand out a sheet on Friday that gives some more details about that. Some of you may have got confused about getting in there. Okay. So we'll see if we can tackle that on Friday. Okay, so what we're going to look now at are factors affecting the SN2 reaction. So remember that the setup for the SN2 reaction was you had nucleophile attacking substrate, and remember it attacked the electrophilic part of the substrate so as to kick the leaving group off. So the factors affecting the reaction are going to be two factors. One factor is the nucleophile, and the other factor is going to be the substrate. And that's what we want to look at today. Okay? So let's look at this one here first. What are things that affect the nucleophile? Okay? at a neutral atom with lone pair compared with a charged atom with lone pair, the charge will always make it a stronger base. Why is that? Because atoms don't like to have charges, so it makes it more reactive.
to react with something to get rid of the charge and go back to neutral. Okay. Yeah. So it would still be stronger than the positive charge. Oh no, it has to be a negative charge. Okay. Negative charge. Right here is a good point to distinguish the difference between what a base is and what a nucleophile is. Okay? How would you describe the definition of a base? Okay? We just drew a pretty good base here. OH minus. Okay. How would you describe that as a base? What does it want to attack? It wants to attack a hydrogen, doesn't it? Yeah. Sure. Can you still see through this? See in the way? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. What's in that molecule? A carbon atom. Okay. So it attacks the carbon atom with the leaving group. Okay. So OH minus can act as a base. It could act as a nucleophile. It just depends what it's attacking. See that? So here, back with this difference, OH minus is a stronger base, and in this case, it's a stronger nucleophile because of the charge, okay? But we want to keep these two distinctions in mind, this distinction in mind between a base and a nucleophile as we look at what affects the nucleophile in these different things we're going to look at, okay? All right, let's look at the next factor. The second factor. Here we want to see which of these two would be the better nucleophile. Which do you think would be the better one? Here is less 
bulky? Or what word did we use for bulky? Yeah. Sterics. Okay. So this here would have less sterics. So would that make it easier to attack the substrate? It sure would. It sure would. Okay. So this thing here would be the better <coughs> nucleophile. CH3 groups on there, these methyls, methyl groups turn out to be electron donating groups. Okay. And as electron donators, what they're doing is dumping electrons into that oxygen. And so it's making the oxygen more electron rich. And so it's making this oxygen a strong base. If you come back over here, this one only has one CH3 to do that. So this will be less electron rich. And so it'll be what? A weaker base. Okay? So this thing turns out to be a stronger base, but what about as a nucleophile? It's a poorer or weaker nucleophile. Okay? So you see how we have to keep the distinction in mind between a base and a nucleophile. Okay? So as a nucleophile, I got to consider the attacking ability of it. And this thing is just too bulky to be a good attacker. Okay? Okay? So you normally don't see Navy SEALs being huge, you know, guys going in there. They're usually slim and can get in there and get the attack done and get out. Okay? Same thing with nucleophiles. The smaller, the better. Okay. Any questions on that distinction there? Okay. Can you still see okay through that? Okay. All right. So that's number two. Let's go on to number three.
Well, can you help me recall what the size is as we go down? What happens to the size? Okay, bigger. Remember frosting the snow. Okay, so bromine's pretty big, and iodine would be even bigger. Okay. So remember, as we went down, since I got more volume. That helped to stabilize the negative charge, and so make it what? A weaker base. Okay, so the more volume for that negative charge, that helped to stabilize it. Okay, remember just like putting you in this room, you're pretty stable. If I stuffed you into a small box, you would be unstable, more reactive to get out of there. Okay. So Br minus would be the weaker base of the three. But we want to know about its being a nucleophile. Okay. Well, as we go down here, okay, these also become what are called softer bases, okay? Versus up, going up top, I get a, a hard base. So what do those terms mean, okay? So when we say something is a softer base, okay, you can think about it as being kind of squishy, like a marshmallow, okay? So, Br minus has squishability to it, like a marshmallow. F minus is like a marble, okay? No squishiness to it, okay? So, because of that, let's suppose we brought in a substrate. There's our substrate. And remember that our electrophile is delta plus. We want to look at which of these three <coughs> can get to that delta plus the easiest. Okay. Well, the bromine is the soft base, and so what it can do is it says, wow, I like to get to that delta plus, so I can squish myself, I can squish my electron density all the way over there. Whereas this fluorine says, no, I can't do that. So in order to attack it, I've got to actually move to get there. Whereas the bromine, can kind of stretch itself to get there easier. See that? So that makes the bromine more nucleophilic, okay? And the ability to reorient its electron density like that is what's called its polarizability. Okay? Polarizability, okay? Reorient electron density. Okay? So if something is a soft base, it will be very polarizable. Okay? So as I go down a group, I get a weaker base, but I get a better nucleophile. Okay? Any questions on that comparison? So if you was to use like chlorine, bromine, and iodine, iodine would be the most nucleophilic. That's right. Uh, It'd be better than bromine. Okay.
Okay, so that's all the factors for uh, the nucleophile. Okay. Let's throw in one thing that's tangential to that. Okay. Again, remember our SN2 reaction. We're reacting these two things. Okay. The one thing we haven't seen yet is that it involves the use of a solvent. And we generally write the solvent underneath the arrow. Why do you think we need a solvent? What does a solvent do? It does what? It separates an ion. Okay. Write a solvent for sugar. What does it do? It dissolves the sugar. Okay. So I need something to dissolve these two so they can mix together. Okay. That's all. I need something to dissolve them to mix them together. Okay. So there turns out to be two kinds of solvents. Okay. Before we look at those two, what kind of solvent do you think I will need? A polar solvent or a non-polar solvent? A polar aprotic, as you can guess. No hydrogen bond. Okay. So you might say, well, what's the big deal if it can hydrogen bond or not? Well, let's take a look at some examples of polar protic solvents. These include water or any kind of alcohol. These have the ability to hydrogen bond. Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, let's suppose that our nucleophile is over here. Let's say our nucleophile was F minus. Okay. And if I was using a polar protic solvent, something like water, okay, the water would start surrounding the nucleophile, and it would start doing what? Hydrogen bonding to it. So it starts hydrogen bonding to it to form what? A cage around it. Okay? So here we get something called a solvent cage. Okay? What do we typically put in cages? Animals. Animals. Anything else? Crazy people. <laughs> Criminals. Okay. Why would you put an animal in a cage? Because they're not going to sell for damage. Oh, wow. Might bite you. Yeah. It might not feel very good. They could kill you. Get a pit bull after you. Go after your neck. Ever get bit by a pit bull? Okay. I don't think you want to be. Okay. So the purpose of the cage is to keep the bull pit bull away from. It. Well, if we put this thing in a cage, can it attack the substrate? No. no. Okay. So here we're trapping 
the nucleophile in a cage like a wild animal. That's not good. That's good for animals. That's good for criminals. That's not good for nucleophiles. Okay? So here, we would what? Not want to use a polar protic solvent. We would instead want to use a polar a protic solvent. Okay? Those can't hydrogen bond, and so they can't form the solvent cage. Okay? It'll free up the nucleophile. So what are some examples of polar aprotic solvents? Yeah, things like this here. CH3CN, acetonitrile. Acetone, polar aprotic. This molecule that will just abbreviate is DMF. So these three are good solvents for SN2. Okay. Now, one other thing about solvents to our SN2 reaction to help it. Okay. So why would this thing help an SN2 reaction? Okay. Well, we got these lone pair on the oxygens. Again, let's pretend our nucleophile is F minus. Well, remember that your nucleophile never comes by itself. Okay? There's always a metal counter ion that comes with it. So if you put some crown ether in here, what can happen is the potassium can come in and enter the crown ether. So once it enters into here, it can get trapped by those oxygens. Do you think that would be good or bad? It's good. Why is it good? Because it frees the fluorine. Okay? So if K plus stays with the fluorine, fluorine is not as free. Now it traps K plus, so now my F minus is free. Free to do what? Free to attack. That's the purpose of the crown ether. It traps the metal like a wild animal.
Did that stop? No, it's still going. Oh, okay. Uh, deals with that of sterics. Okay. Let's look at a bunch of substrates here. different substrates. What's the difference in these substrates? Okay, they all have the same leaving group, don't they? Chlorine. So it's not the leaving group. We're going to deal with the leaving group next time. Instead, it has to do with what? The number of carbons on what? The electrophilic carbon. Okay? This one has all hydrogens. And then we're adding more and more carbons there. Okay? So remember, hydrogen is the tiniest atom on the periodic table. Okay? Hydrogens are tiny. They're like little points of a pen. But as soon as you enter something else, like a carbon, CH3, now I have a bigger group. And now I have two bigger groups. And now I have three bigger groups. Get the idea. Easy question, easy answer. Which of them? could allow the nucleophile to get in the easiest. This one here? This one here. See how easy that was? Okay. So the best substrate is the one what? With the more hydrogens on it. The worst substrate is the one with more carbons on it. Okay. So here, this is the best. This thing here is the worst. Okay. So this here is a methyl chloride substrate. And then we have a primary 
secondary and a tertiary. Okay? So a tertiary would be the worst substrate we would want to use for SN2. It would be bad. Okay? Mm -hmm. CH3 would be excellent. A methyl is very good too. When I get to, or a primary is good too, when I get to a secondary, it starts getting a little more difficult, but it can still work. But once I get to tertiary, it's not going to go well. It'll be very, very slow. Okay? So, this is the first difference with the substrate. Okay? Like I said, we'll look at the second difference on Friday. But let me finish up here by looking at some examples from your homework. Okay. Let's see if we can do these together here. Okay, we're going to put up our different uh, substrates and you say which one is the better substrate. Take a second and see if we can figure out which is the better substrate in each case. Okay. If you could picture what the molecule looks like, fine. If you need to draw the molecule out, then do all the hard work and figure it out. Okay. Give you a minute, Pam. Butyl is the worst. That's a tertiary. This one here is primary. Okay. So this is a primary substrate. So this one here is your winner. How about the second one? First. The cyclohexyl bromide. Here, I got an extra methyl group on the one position. So that's a tertiary. Okay, so secondary would be tertiary. Okay, so 
So these two here are tertiary. Remember, they're bad. What about the last one? Okay, so here is 2-bromobutane, and over here is isopropyl bromide. So which would be the better substrate? They're both secondary, aren't they? So now what do I do? Okay. Well here, the difference is what? This has an ethyl group, which is bigger than a methyl group. So this will have a little more sterics, so this would be better. Okay? Does that force you to think a little bit? Hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay, hope you like thinking. Okay? Any questions on those? Okay? So those are typical multiple choice things you might see on the next test. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll look to see you on Friday.